Hello. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Ian Johnson, one of the co-organizers of the D3 Meetup, um, helping to host this uh, event. I'm really excited today. Um, many of you were probably with us in February to celebrate D3's 10th anniversary. We actually held it on the 10-year birthday of, of D3 when it was released. If you weren't at that event, I want to share um, the, the video with you, as well as the chat log, which was a lot of fun. Um, and I hope today's will be as well. So speaking of that, I do want to say, you know, we're going to be showing a lot of projects from a lot of members of the community, really exciting, passionate stuff. We have people who submitted um, that are students to seasoned professionals. So I just want to keep keep that in mind, have everybody keep this a celebratory uh, and constructive kind of chat. Uh, but I think we can have a lot of a lot of fun and we'll see a lot of really interesting perspectives. Um, I'd also like to point out that we do have a code of conduct and we are following that. So um, you know we will be moderating the chat in case uh, people feel they don't need to. And um, again, just want this to be a safe and, and fun time. So with that, I'd uh, love to invite Molly uh, Pettit up to the, to the stage um, to, to host this parade, kick it off. And um, yeah, Molly, why don't you say hi? Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thanks for kicking it off. Um, I am going to kind of get into what to expect from this event and um, and get things moving. All right. So I will step back and. All and right. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, first I'm going to just give you a rundown of what's going to happen today uh, during the event. We're going to. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the parade, like the what and the why behind it. Um, we're going to get a look at a bunch of really great community focused projects that came out of the parade. And it's going to be quick. Uh, we're going to have to get through them uh, quickly, only a few minutes per project because uh, there's uh, just a lot of stuff to share. Um, if you have any questions, toss it in the chat. You know, if we have a spare moment, we can ask. Um, and then we'll also be sharing uh, you know, Twitter handles and, and things of, of, of folks who created the projects. So you can reach out to them yourself as well. Um, after the parade, we'll end with some Q&A from Mike Bostock. Uh, start thinking of questions now that you might want to ask. And, uh, and then before we get to that, we'll also be showing um, just kind of a short community montage uh, that uh, we showed also at the February event, but it's very short. Um, and it just kind of showed people talking about like, uh, you know, what they love about D3. So first we're gonna talk a bit more about like, what's this whole parade thing? As many of you know, uh, and as Ian mentioned, uh, we recently celebrated the 10 year uh, anniversary uh, in February. And a lot of you might've been there. Um, it was, it was really great, uh, a really nice talk from Mike. So the whole point of this parade is to celebrate the community that has sprung up around D3 since its creation 10 years ago. So a contest was held and the two really main guidelines of this was one, that it has to use D3. It doesn't have to just use D3, it can use other things, but it needs to use D3. And it must relate be related to the theme of celebrating the D3 community. So some data sets were prepared for this occasion, such as uh, some blocks data set, uh, Git history, NPM downloads. Um, and then some people also sourced additional data sets of their own. The contest submission deadline was a couple weeks ago. And since then, some of you may have seen that uh, we've been sharing submissions everywhere on Twitter and in Slack. And um, I believe a newsletter uh, went out today as well. Um, so now we're kind of bringing everyone together and we're gonna get a closer look. 
Also, I want to say a quick thanks to our wonderful sponsors, uh, Front End Masters and Observable and uh, D3 Unconf. And all of these, um, all of the people who submitted, they'll be going home with a sweet data viz resource, whether it be a book or a Front End Masters year subscription. So, um, very cool. Uh, I think now we're to the point where we can really kick things off. I can stop talking. Um, I'm going to play that short video clip we mentioned, and then we're going to start getting into looking at projects. So here we go. I, I'm so it's it's sometimes I think like if it wasn't for D3, where would my life even even be? What career would I have right now? And I think that's so amazing that and I'm not the only one that has that. And it's it's I think it's so amazing that this this one sort of tool library I don't even know quite know what to call it, um, it how it has affected so many people's lives. I think that I think that's that's quite an achievement. And I'm really happy for it. And uh, the other reason I love D3 is because of the developer community. Uh, it's just an invaluable, you know, source of inspiration and information with uh, unbelievably talented members and also helpful members. I learned so much from the D3 community. I love the help channel. Uh, I think that the community that's there is great. I'm glad that we can come together and be able to help people from all skill levels. I you know, I joined and I lurked for a long time while I was still learning D3, and now I try and, and help. Bonjour, je m'appelle Christophe Bio. Hi, you want me to help? Hey, I'm Adam. My name is Mike Freeman. My name's Rachel Binks. Hi, I'm Tony Tucker. Hello, I'm Curran. I'm Ian Johnson. My name's Jeffrey here. I'm Amelia Wattenberger. Hi, I'm Philippe Pedier. My name is Tony Chu. My name is Maya Gans. Hey, my name is Bill Morris. Hey, uh, my name is Bo Erickson. My name is John Alexis Guerra Gomez. Hello, my name is Shirley Wu. Hey there, this is Molly Pettit here. I, as well as many people in the data viz field, had a circuitous journey to get where I'm at. And then it was working as a data scientist that I encountered data visualization and specifically D3, and I thought it was just awesome. Because it uh, essentially externalizes cognition. It lets you think about the world in a totally data-driven way that's grounded in reality. And D3 is just this wonderful expanse of possible ways to visualize data. The ability to draw with data is just so fantastic. So thank you and uh, happy 10th birthday, D3. All right. Uh, now I'm going to bring uh, Kai to the stage, who's going to help me host today. Hello, Kai. Hello, Molly. <laughs> Are you ready to get started? Yeah, let's get started this morning. Let's check out some D3 Parade entries. Okay, yeah, well, so before we actually check out the D3 Parade entries, um, there's one uh, project that we wanted to focus on um, quick, which is, well, I'll just bring Phil on and uh, we can chat about it a bit. Phil. Hello. Do you want to talk a bit about this? Oh. Yeah, so it, it was... Um, I lost my headphones, but I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk a bit about this Protoviz uh, project and why it makes sense that we might kick things off with it? Yeah, sure. So um, when we were talking about uh, the 10th anniversary, I was uh, thinking about that what came before D3. And it was uh, uh, this piece of so software called Protoviz. And um, I suppose Mike will, will, talk, about, will talk about it also. Um, and um, one example, I mean, so I, I basically I wanted to see Protoviz could run in Observable. And um, it works, <laughs> as you can see. And uh, I like this particular example, which is uh, based on uh, Jacques Bertin's uh, Examples, so yeah, you, maybe you know uh, semiology graphic, and uh, it's in another book. I have the whole collection, of course. It's about a, a hotel, a hotel manager who tries to. I mean, he has like a, a big table, 
Do you see the, the big table here? Yeah. I can see it. You can see it, but you can't really understand it. So it transforms this table into this chart, right? And this chart shows month after month which kinds of uh, clients come to the hotel. And so you can start to think about, you know, seasonality and uh, when you are going to hire new people and so on. And that's something you, you can't do with the table, but you, you can do with the, with the chart. So basically, that's that's my example. It's really off limits for the contest, but I think it's a good uh, contribution to the parade. So you and why Protoviz? Why Tell Protoviz? us about Protoviz. Uh, I've never used Protoviz, but uh, I kind of understand that it was like the predecessor to V3. It was what uh, led to what led Mike to like redesign from scratch after after he did protoviz did you notice anything strange or feel anything weird about protoviz's api as you were using it after being used to d3 for so um, many years i just used it like for this one notebook so i i don't know <laughs> i just thought that uh, yeah that was this uh, way of writing functions if you if you go in the details um I mean, the, and if you go to the original Protovis example, there are, there's a way of writing functions that I don't know where it comes from or how it used to work or how it works. So it's it's a bit different than the JavaScript I'm used to. But that's that's all I can say about Protovis. Cool. Well, yeah, I think it was a great way to start off as a D3 prode uh, predecessor. Um, so thanks for joining us, Phil. And we're going to keep the parade moving. Thanks. So thanks so much. Bye. Thank you, Phil. OK, so we're going to keep moving. We're going to go to this next project by Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Hello. How are you Tell doing? Us about, doing well. How are you? Doing great. Tell us about your project. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, very excited to be here. Um, so uh, displayed here uh, is uh, a visualization of all the uh, commits uh, within the D3 repo, courtesy of Ian Johnson's data set. Thank you for providing that. Um, and so this is a uh, what's called a spiral heat map. Uh, this is something uh, that I think there are a few other submissions with this type of chart as well, but I like to make it more of a thing uh, along the same vein as you know, that's so fetch and streets ahead spiral time series uh, heat maps. Um, and so the earliest commits are you know, in the, near the center of that uh, spiral, uh, and then outer uh, radii arcs would be the, the later commits. Um, and yeah, two things I just really love about uh, the, these types of charts is that uh, you know, similar with all kind of radial charts, uh, it's very compact. Uh, like this is literally every day between like March 2013 to January uh, 2021, uh, and it fits well within the screen. Um, and the second thing is that uh, they you know, pretty well illustrates the uh, cyclical patterns that come up uh, within our you know our constructs of time, uh, where midnight turns to 1 a.m. and you know, uh, or for those on 24-hour time, you have 23 rolls over to zero. In this case, we have the days of the week. Um, there's a couple features to call out. Um, you see in the you know near the center there, uh, right before the you know, that dark uh, circle there, um, would be the time period uh, what I refer to as the dark ages of D3. When uh, Mike, <laughs> fortunately for him, unfortunately for us, he was gainfully employed by the New York Times and couldn't uh, <laughs> uh, submit too many commits uh, at least as, as frequently in the D3 repo, um, but mm -hmm. followed that um, so this is yeah, between 2013 and 2015 or so, uh, but immediately following that, you have this Renaissance period of a uh, you know, very um, uh, nice, like clear white band there um, uh, for about a year or so, and then beyond that, it's more of a st stochastic distribution uh, for those bands. Uh, another thing to call out is uh, just based on my rough eyeballing, it does seem like Saturday and Sunday are a bit darker uh, than the others. So good to see that they took breaks on the weekend. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, I just really want to uh, thank uh, the D three contributors so much for all your hard work um, uh, and especially for uh, making it so extensible and flexible. 
um, because the only reason I was able to make this chart is thanks to uh, Tom Shanley's uh, D3 spiral heat map library um, to oh, figure cool. out all the math uh, involved in the arcs and positioning. Um, I would have been hopelessly lost without that. And so <laughs> um, you can see that in the explanatory text below. Um, but yeah, just, thanks so much for having me. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I love the dark ages in the center of this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. Right. See you, everybody. All right. That was awesome. Moving on, um, keeping things going. We are going to bring on Loris. See, here we go. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hi, Loris. Thanks a lot for, for organizing. Uh, uh, the, the, three, the three parades was uh, really nice to, to join. Um, yeah, thanks so, for joining. Uh, I guess, can you see my screen or not yet? Oh, um, here, I can add your screen. I'll take mine off. There we go. OK, great. Uh, so the idea of this visualization was to actually um, show 10 different ways to analyze the most frequent col colors in uh, in uh, the publication uh, and visualization in the past made with the blocks, uh, so the idea was not necessarily <laughs> to uh, to give proper visualization like this one is more uh, for fun to give some operate effect. But then I decided to convert uh, actually these colors and change the format to HSL to get a bit of uh, an analysis for some visualizations. So basically, the the project is. Uh, is a set of representation of the visualization like this one. Uh, you cannot really uh, try to analyze it. But then uh, I decided to, as I said, change the format, uh, which is something I did uh, in uh, in Python before to uh, get to understand the UA, the saturation, and the lightness. Uh, but that's pretty much it. And at the very end, uh, I think this one is actually <laughs> the most useful chart uh, made out of this uh, whole visualization. Uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, insightful. And at the very end, I have uh, this uh, this piece which I uh, post-processed. Uh, but at the very beginning, what I wanted to do was uh, to come up with something like uh, this <laughs> and colors. But uh, I didn't manage to to get something uh, with a, a nice uh, a nice format, so I decided not to to share it. But yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks to uh, Mike Bostock and everyone of the contributors to to make. Uh, this uh, library really cool, really nice to play with, and uh, and yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Also, thanks to um, thank you to uh, Ian Johnson who actually came up with uh, a proper data set with the colors all clean. I think uh, without this, I wouldn't have the, the courage to to fetch uh, all these colors uh, by myself. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you what inspired you to look at the colors, but was it seeing the data set and then you knew? <laughs> Yeah, I I first had a look at all the data set I have uh, I uh, we had access to, and then I uh, managed to to get something with this one. So <laughs> that was pretty much it. Very awesome, nice, yeah. cool. Well, thank you for sharing. I posted the link into the uh, chat, so if other people want to check it out. And thanks so much, Loris, for sharing. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, who do we have next? So actually, um, the next project, uh, the person was unable to join us, so I'll go ahead and share it. <clears throat> Let me post the comment here. And here you go, this is by, <clears throat> excuse me, by Gabrielle. Um, and this is looking at uh, the colors of blocks. So I'm going to go ahead and click on here. And it looks like, let's see, created by the D3 community. Data is mapped to a canvas element describing the color most frequently used by each block and later tree map visualization to detail all the colors of the selected block. So OK, so if we select any of these. It shows a tree map, and it looks like I can, I can go through to like the block that it's highlighting. Yeah, the tree maps are really cool. Just to click around or hover around there and 
see all these colors just uh, make a little tapestry. I'm having trouble having these load, but um, cool. Anything, anything we else we wanted to dive into on this one? Let's see. I found a couple when I was clicking around that had like 50 colors and it was, it was oh, yeah. to see, neat to see the tree map layout on those. I yeah. think it was one by, by Curran and one by Helen McConkey. Very colorful. I mean, there's, there's thousands here, so. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Okay. Very nice, Gabriel. Huh? Very nice, Gabriel. Yes, very nice. Thank you for participating. And sorry you couldn't make it. Okay, we're going to march onward then. All right, next one's by Brett Cooper, I believe. Brett Cooper. Um, I don't see him backstage at this moment. I wonder um, if, I, I believe he said he was coming. So I'm gonna maybe march on to Mark and then we can come back to Brett and maybe by then he'll be with us and otherwise we'll showcase it. Um, Mark is here. So hello. Hello all. Hello, Mark. Oh, I need to get rid Hi, of Mark. Here we go. No, okay. not... oh, I thought I had yours up. Hold on. I I'll get it. <laughs> this is Brett's. Can can you share my screen? Oh yeah, I can do that. Okay. Uh you need to click uh share your screen and then I'll be able to put it up onto the Okay. <laughs> Okay, I can add that. Okay, so um, I started off with colors like a lot of people and I couldn't really find anything interesting. So I went on to um, branching, see if I, could, um, if I could create an interesting visualization from the, uh, the branching of Git. And I started off with um, a force directed graph, but all it produced for me was a very long line. So that wasn't much good. And then I did it as a horizontal line, but as you can see, there's a lot of empty space. And so the force directed graph then made me think if I could squash it up like a spiral, I could fit it onto a page with any scroll bars. So that's what I went with. So um, just explain how I made it. So, so I, first of all, I ordered all the commits by time. Um, so. Uh, commits basically have one or more parents, and if they have two parents, it's a branch. And if the um, parent um, connects back into an existing branch, it's a merge. And then I had to work out when the start and end of each of the branches, and then you move the branches up so they get some free space, and then find if there's enough room to show the branch uh, name. And then I mapped it onto a spiral. And um, using the uh, SVG get point at length, and then projected it out from the center of the spiral to get the proper position. So you end up with um, with this. So I ordered all the repos uh, by the number of commits, and then each commit uh, is sized by the number of file addition and deletions. So the one with the most branches is D3Geo. Um, so it makes quite an interesting pattern. And then you go down and the spiral gets smaller and smaller. So that's me. Oh. <laughs> Infinite. Great that's explanation awesome. of how you constructed this, Mark. Yeah, I love that you went through and showed the thought process of how you got to here. And could you show D3Geo one more time? That one looks great. OK. There you go. Oh, yeah. That one's fun. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed going through these. Like I like some of them were quite colorful. Some of them had a lot of these like branches happening and um yeah, they all kind of have their own like feel to them. <laughs> yeah. It's it's amazing about the work that uh, Mike has done over the years. You know, you can see how many commits he's done. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, this is really cool. Thank you so much uh for for sharing and joining and no problem. cool thanks so um, much mark I, oh, go ahead i'll try and stop sharing now so you don't get any information <laughs> right. bye thanks all right bye
Okay, let's see. Who do we have next? Oh yeah, we're gonna come back to Brett. Um, uh, I'll go ahead and share this from my screen and share it in the chat. Here we go. Um, yeah, so did, did you wanna walk through this one, Kai? Oh, sure. Put you on the spot. Yeah, I mean, th these are uh, daily downloads from NPM. You can kind of see that, that we have, uh, 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 wait, is Brett on? I don't know, this is just, this is just the name. Um, sort of lighter activity on the weekends. Is that what these, what these columns are? Um, let's see, I think I can hover. No, let's see. Stacked. 2015, 16. Oh, here, yeah. If I if I hover, it'll eventually show. So are these weekends? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, I, this this visualization it feels like a wall of eyes. It looks like you're looking into a forest of just a stack of toads or something. Is what it feels <laughs> like to me, like a wall of hypno toads or something. Um, and there's a really cool uh, color selector legend that that makes it even a little more psychedelic if you flip these around. It's a very strange feeling of looking at this wall of eyes. Oh, this is fun, yeah. <laughs> Which one do I like most? I feel like this one is like very psychedelic. Cool. So thank you, Brett. This this visualization, Daily Downloads is, is watching you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Brett. Okay, now, let's see, move on and welcome, Matthias. Oh, I need to actually pull up the image. <laughs> um, Hi, everyone. There we go. I had it ready. There. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. Yeah, that looks good. <laughs> Everything is on screen. Great, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Matthias. I'm I'm a freelance data risk designer based in Germany. So here it's not good morning, but it's almost good night. And yeah, when I usually create data visualizations, I always try to find the sweet spot between revealing patterns and telling individual stories. And I think revealing patterns on the one hand is important when we work with big data and data visualizations help us to discover hidden knowledge and lets us access complicated statistics. But in contrast, we humans have a hard time understanding abstract numbers and uncertainties and all that. And this is why I also want to find individual stories in a data set. Because we humans, we are story-driven people. We get emotional about a story and not, not really about mere statistics. And my project here for the D3 Parade is um, basically another attempt to achieve this. Um, so we had this great data set of all the colors used in, in our D3 blocks. And if you have a look at the circle here on the right, it's fascinating to check out the overall color usage patterns. So there it's really about the patterns. You can see the standard colors, for instance, or even like missing shades in between and all that. And that all sorted by the year. So you can also see if there are changes over the years or not. But even behind these, these colors, I think there are hidden personal stories. So for example, on the left then, on this uh, one bar, you see Nadi Bremer, for example, she has by far the most colorful palettes and you see some other people having a focus on other colors, for example. So yeah, and that's all st telling stories with data. This is possible with D3 and really thank you to Mike and to the whole community that you created this um, 10 years ago and still ongoing um, to build such uh, cool visualizations all over the place. Thank you very much. Thanks. And I was very curious about this Fer Fergus development LLC. Did, did you did you take a look at the block? That, uh... <laughs> yeah, I encourage you to check them out. Um, in, in that case, I think uh, he or she um, had like uh, these, a canvas with an image and this image was made up of pixels and every pixel had a certain color. And then they got assembled with an animation using D3. And this is why there are all these like uh, brown shady colors. <laughs> oh. Very cool. I didn't mean to stop 
sharing. <laughs> that was my bad. <laughs> yeah, I always, I always, uh, I always like uh, finding a new new person's blocks gallery. Um, and uh, yeah, several of these were fun to fun to look it's, through. So, are all of these similar? Are all of these the same palette? They're just the largest it's palette. It's it's just uh, the people with the largest or with the most diverse color palettes, yeah. And these okay. rainbow ones, yeah, they look similar, but they are not identical, uh, certainly. Um, but it just says, okay, they're using colors from from the full palette, uh, whereas others uh, only have colors from from a certain new range, for example. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, this is very colorful and fun. Enjoy it a lot. Thanks for thanks for uh, yeah being a part of this. Thanks, yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> okay, next up, Maya and is do you know if Matt's going to be joining us today, Maya? Um, I think he's here. Cool. <laughs> um, if you're here, uh, Matt check your email and I'll pull you on stage if you join us in the backstage. <laughs> well, in the, yeah, in the meantime, while Matt does that, or if yeah. he doesn't, um, I like selfishly, okay, so this community is incredible and I, we are both pretty cheese that we wanted to make a visual of blocks because this is the building blocks of the community, stacking them all together. Um, so, and then on a meta kind of level of a visual about community, I found this opportunity to be like a really chill, low pressure environment to learn a lot of cool new things about D3 with Matt, who is an amazing uh, visual uh, visualization artist here. So we, we created two visuals, one of which is like more on the artistic side. Um, each we're calling them kind of triads, so those three L's. Um, if you could scroll a little down, please. Um, yeah, so we have a legend here where um, the the left-hand side is the number, this is using the GitHub uh, data that was put together for the, um, for the parade. So the left-hand side is the number of files that were edited each one of each triad is a commit, I should say that. And then the left is how many files were edited. The top is the author. And then the right hand side is the repo that they contributed to. And because there's so many repos and so and so many authors, like it should be a categorical scale, but you know, we're just having fun here. And um, this one was more artistic. And that's why we made a second plot, which is above this one of the top contributors to the D3 library. So we aggregated that um, and then incorporated hover data. So if you can hover over one of those triads, you could see who that contributor was, how many, the total files that they contributed um, and other data. And the, the most fun part of this visualization was like, we had this crazy idea in our brains and how to execute this, but also make it generalizable in a way that if you have data that lends itself to this, where it has three kind of aspects to each uh, subset, if you will, um, you can take this code and we kind of made up a new plot type, we think, maybe. So so yeah, pretty exciting. Um, it was a lot of fun. And yeah, I'm that. sure Matt can talk more about like the process of what went into how to organize all these things, but it was super fun working with Matt. Um, yeah, sure. I'll just like say something real quick. By the way, oh, thanks for um, happy to be here. Sorry, I was like a couple minutes late. Um, no welcome, man. Thanks. Yeah, I think as Maya said, we we kind of had this idea and we just kind of had a blast with it. Like, yes, probably you know we're visualizing a bit too many categories to like really discern from the colors, but it's more it's more about kind of like at an abstract level kind of seeing all the differences and like you kind of get this vibe that like no two things are the same but there's also you know patterns and we just kind of like the way that that sort of spoke to the community kind of at, at a high level um so yeah i don't know we, we had a lot of fun with this one i did something for the first time that i had never done before where i did that thing where you make your own symbol so even though it's an svg you use the like 
context, uh, the canvas sy syntax to make your own symbols. So that's how we did this. Uh, that was really fun. New that was a thing I'd never done before. Cool. This would look great as one of those database scarfs or blanket or <laughs> yeah. something. Oh my God, yeah. I would totally wear something like leggings or something with this. <laughs> or a poster, tap it on the wall or something. <laughs> a Zoom background. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you oh, so and much. There's a really cool oh, um, go ahead. color. Can we see the color? Uh, oh, here? I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to uncheck this box. Oh, OK. So extra. I love it. <laughs> oh. And yeah, you can you get a nice one. And if you go all the way back to the top, I like I like the this it's really yeah. neat the way the, yeah. <laughs> this top one recolors as well. Yeah. That's really cool. That is extra, but I like it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Maya and Matt. I'm glad that you made Thank it. You. Um, yeah, thanks, you. Thanks, community. Guys. Cool. All right, later guys. Okay. Now, let's see who, oh, Alec, I believe is next. Pull up Alec, bring up. Hi, Alec. Here, I'm gonna hey, start this from the going? beginning. Great, yeah, thank good. you. Good, how are you? Um, hey, great, I'm Alec, I'm a software engineer in New York and a instructor at uh, Parsons um, DataViz program. Uh, so I wanted to look at the evolution of D3 modules um, in GitHub and I wanted to think about transitions. I think transitions are one of the most powerful parts of, uh, of D3. Um, and I decided to show the history of the visualization itself um, in a third dimension. So instead of changing the visualization and losing the context of where we had just come from, um, I'm preserving each previous frame uh, one, one layer behind the new frame. Um, I used uh, D3 tree map layout, but actually drew this in Canvas. And I think it's a nice reminder that, you know, I first learned D3 as a way to manipulate SVGs in the DOM, but actually the layout and utility um, modules are hugely powerful on their own um, and, uh, and can plug and play with a lot of other tools. And uh, yeah, down below, I also, you know, created, was experimenting with different ways of showing the same data um, each module is a line, and the uh, net total lines of code is the um, the height of the line over time. And the little uh, diff chart below it um, is the the ads and deletions in uh, in GitHub. Um, yeah, this was this was fun to make. Very cool. Yeah, you can see some nice refactoring is happening here. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a reminder that. Building the library is not a, a linear process, and sometimes less is more. It feels oh, like the tree map is is marching at me. Um. <laughs> yeah, it also reminded me a little bit of like a an old school library card catalog, where you can like mm. filter through the the cards in a in a drawer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could totally get that imagery. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Alec. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Thanks, Molly and Kai, and, and thanks to Mike and the whole community. All right, marching on to the next float, as you might say, in the parade. Uh, we'll bring on Robert. Hi. Hey, Robert. Yeah, Here. so. I'll go ahead and hit play. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so. I also looked at the um, the GitHub data here, and I really like network graphs just in general. And so I felt it was sort of a natural pairing between the GitHub network uh, repos and contributors and the network that they have. So as you can see, it visualizes from the first uh, data we have, which I think is from 2013 um, till now uh, of how the repo grows. And so if you actually scroll on it, you can shrink and grow and, and see how it, uh, see like the whole thing. So yeah, so I, I do like to have, um, just show like what it looks like over time like that. And I think one of the challenging things with uh, D3 networks is um, changing them, like changing the data on them without uh, like regenerating the whole thing or, and like changing the position. So that was sort of a, a challenging aspect to get right for this. But 
it comes out pretty snappy and it gets to the point where you can scroll the uh the scroller and sort of see at different points and have it like grow and shrink itself really fast so overall i think it uh it sort of does a good mix of giving you individual level data so you can see like the individual people while still having like the backgrounds that are colored by the uh, repositories so I, I i definitely felt like it was a good way to visualize this sort of data it's surprisingly legible even as it gets uh so densely crowded um, yeah no it, it that's sort of it was essential to add like uh the zooming into it because early on you want it to be pretty close and then as you grow you do want to be able to go different parts and then also adding um sort of some opacity to the uh background so that you can see other names when it gets all bunched up but yeah so I, it was it was definitely um it was sort of challenging but really fun to make yeah i really enjoyed this one i remember pressing play and you know it's like very quiet and it's just like <laughs> yeah and I found yeah. that really fun. I just want to go to that spot again and see. Yeah, I think it's, it's hard when you just see like a line like go flat and then go really fast up to really get a sense for like what that looks like. But I felt like this was a good way of visualizing like what does it look like when complexity explodes very rapidly in a system. So I, I, I definitely felt that's something I wanted to try to capture. And I, I think it does a good job of that. Another thing yeah. I liked is that over time, as more and more things get added, repos sort of move towards each other when they're worked on by related people so at a certain point you see like some of the geo related ones sort of move together because certain people contribute to those a lot some of the other like utility ones move together and then the, of course like the people that contribute the most in a lot of different places like mike like uh phil and others uh sort of end up in the center there oh sure yeah very cool Any other questions on this, Kai, before we march on? And this is um, the, this is, you built this, this sort of graph um, uh, blocks updating kind of component. That's yeah, I, I've done these sort of things before with a couple other things. Um, and I've always found it challenging to make uh, a way for you to update a network graph without mm -hmm. having to regenerate the whole data. So I put together, still work in progress, but you can see like the link down there um, for just, uh, a, a simple API to add new data into an existing system and have it update it without like resetting everything back to the starting point. So if anyone wants to help on that or have advice, like feel free to take a look. Very useful. Awesome. Cool. Thanks so much, Robert. This is cool. I definitely want to say thanks to Mike uh, and the whole D3 community, but specifically Mike for deciding to split the repos up into multiple sub repos because this visualization would not be possible if it was just these three right in the middle and then like a billion links coming out. Of <laughs> yeah, totally. Probably keeps things organized too. <laughs> All right, thanks, cool. Robert. Thanks so much, Robert. Thanks, guys. All right. Next up, we had Leslie. Um, I know she said she was planning on coming and I just pinged her the link. So I'm going to march the next one. We can go back. Um, hopefully she'll, she'll be with us. So, uh, I'm going to share, um, let's see, or er, Ermilla's project, uh, she said is not actually going to be with us, uh, to share it today, but said, we're welcome to share it, uh, in her stead. So, uh, this is a project, uh, that she put together um, when anytime she as uh, she was learning D3 and putting uh, projects together, she would keep track of all of the different D3 resources and blocks and and various things that she would use in order to create them. And so this visualization, um, it's kind of like in a way like a meta project, right? Because it's a project that's visualizing resources of all her projects, which is kind of cool. It's I feel like it's visualizing your Chrome screen right now, just how many tabs you have to have open to <laughs> make a D3 visualization. Yeah. Um, and this is so organized to keep track of, of all the resources you use for a single project. I wish I was that organized. Yeah, and I it, it'd be kind of cool if, like, to kind of be able to click through to the different resources and things. Um, but I really, but like, she kind of pulls out some of the the bigger ones and um you know some of the people uh who she learned from like scott murray and shirley and elijah um 
you could see the shift from um, blocks to observable notebooks too in some of these. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I want to read this, see if there's anything else to add. Uh, I think that's it. But um, yeah, I thought this was really pretty. And uh, thank you, Irmala, for uh, participating in the parade. And um, I threw the link to this into the chat. Cool, beautiful little tidy trees. Yeah. <laughs> OK. I will go back then to Leslie's project. Um, oh, I will update. Here we go. And toss this in the comments. Cool. Uh, do you want to walk through this one, Kai? Um, yeah, this is 10 years of D3. Or this goes back to 2015, I believe, is when the start date is 20. Um, or does this go all the way back to 1.0? I can't. What, what, what's that year right in the middle? I can't quite read it on this. Middle. Page. Looks like 2013. 2013, okay. <laughs> yeah. And these are commits. You can kind of see this. Um, uh, it's, it's, it reminds me of Kevin's the the dark ages in the middle. There's just a gap of um, a gap of dots in the middle there where there were not a lot of commits um, for the first the couple of years ages. of this visualization. <laughs> and then it's kind of the the inverse. You can see this very dense period from the 2016 or so, um, especially in yeah. June and May, of just just tons tons of commits and really nice interaction here. This is a very relaxing way I felt to browse the Git history. Yeah, totally. And then let's see, commit. Oh, commits by month. Is that different with contributors? Okay, lines changed. August 2018 had the most amount of lines of code added, it looks like, to the D3 repos. And August 2019, the most amount of deletions. Oh, interesting. I hadn't actually read these like side notes before. Uh, was, that, was that version five or? And then June 2015 had the most amount of commits made. What are the notes on by month? September saw least amount of commits and June is the month with most. Oh cool. I like I like how she pulled out these like little um, you know tidbits uh, to help with the uh, you know rather than just like here's all the data. So like, here's all the data, but also here's like some neat little stories that come out of it. That's cool. Yeah, great annotations. Yeah. Okay. Next up. Hi. Adam is. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. And, and yeah, thanks, thanks for, for joining. Everybody. Yeah, uh, I'm Adam S. And I can talk a little bit about the project. C can you share my screen? Yeah, sure. Yeah. OK, wonderful. Uh, so yeah, so I start from the block builder data set. Um, and I guess. On the first meetup, I think Phil mentioned something about to you map the, the thumbnails. And then I was like, OK, I think I'm going to try that. And I start downloading all the uh, thumbnails. Unfortunately, um, out of 40,000 blocks, we um, only like about 80,000 blocks were like real uh, images. And um, the idea here is to take this massive vector of pixels and use UMAP to, to project this in a two-dimensional space. And then um, we can reorganize the, um, the thumbnails in this um, UMAP sort of sort. And the thumbnails will be um, uh, clustered um, with their similarity color. And, and in, in this case, color would be more the pixels and it's not that interesting, I guess. It's just uh, clustered in by its color. Um, so you can see just the, the dark thumbnails organized with um, 
white white ones and and then I try um, using um, another feature um, um, model, which pretty much look at um, uh, features on the thumbnails, and it's more interesting because you can actually look at um, sections where you see maps, but you also see like the globe, and then actually the, the feature that can find other patterns that the color cannot find it. Um, yeah, so I use uh, PixJS as a WebGL backend, but I use D3 mostly for all the user interaction and um, yeah, Zoom and everything else. I was very inspired by this project here, which is um, pretty much um, using WebGL in the backend. And also, I was interested in in like how could, can we reduce 200 megabytes into a, a basis texture? Yeah, so everything. That's how you render out all of these uh, blocks. Yes, yes. So okay. I, all the 9,000 thumbnails, there are like 200 megabytes, so I compress them to a, a basis a basis image, which is 8 mm -hmm. megabytes, and then kind of crop slices of textures. OK, because this is so smooth with all of these blocks flying around and the, the hover interaction. It feels buttery smooth the whole time. Yeah, so I think it's like mostly WebGL using PixJS, which is a very easy way to access WebGL without writing like shaders and everything else. And then I was experimenting with the, the, the basis texture, which is a really powerful way to compress textures. And pretty much, it's like a, I can I crop slices of the textures and then I construct um, the individual thumbnails. And then I use D3 to do the animations and like going to the map projection. Oh, of course, I use also the um, LP um, linear assignment problem to kind of transfer the, the map projection to a grid like, which is much more enjoyable to see. Because if you just use the map, things are going um, over. Late and yeah, I have a um, collab notebook I can share later. But basically, this is actually when you do the linear assignment problem, you kind of try to find uh, positions in the grid. That's why it's also squared, the whole thing is squared because I couldn't find a way to make no rectangular. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really, all. That's, yeah, that really I think useful. in the future, I could I mean, you know, uh, use Puppeteer and try to extract the thumbnails of the 40,000 blocks. That'd be cool to see. And a lot, a lot of maps, <laughs> they all look the same, yeah. Cool, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, Radamid. Yeah, that was very cool. Thank you so much for sharing. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you. All right, next up we have Curran, let's see. Ah, hello. Welcome. Hello, <laughs> hi Curran. Let's see. Oh, you can actually show your screen. if you, I'll put yours on. One second. There Great. we go. Yeah, I've yeah. got mine up. Oh, is this it? This is it. <laughs> <laughs> this looks familiar. I feel like I've made this visualization. Before. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we all? So I have I actually have the lineage of different versions. So I kind of want to step through them and give a sense of how this thing evolved. So this was my first pass of like, okay, get some data to show up on the screen. And huge shout out to Ian Johnson, who prepared this amazing uh, Git history data and the scraping scripts. Very cool. And then I added color. And then I was like, what is this? Like, just doesn't even make any sense. But it's kind of beautiful as abstract art. So in the spirit of um, hashtag D3 broke and made art, I animated it, which is fun. <laughs> Uh, but I genuinely didn't know why there was all this overlap. So I asked for help, and somebody came to the rescue. Thank you, Daniel Ness. It was the sorting of the dates. And so then we got this. And so my idea was to go for a stream graph, a stacked area chart, where each layer is one of the Git repositories. And this was the first pass. Um, one thing that stood out is there's this giant triangle, meaning there, there's something a bit off. So I, I fixed that by aggregating by week. So now it's number of commits per week per repository 
just as a stacked area chart. But you can't really read this. It's very, very jagged. And then when you apply the, you know, the wiggle layout for the stream graph, it looks like this, which is, is kind of cool too, but also not readable. And I found that the key was to apply smoothing. Ooh. And a um, huge shout out to Phil for his library that I think is called Array Blur that I'm using here. And this labeling library I put together years ago to add the labels. And so now you can actually see the data. But one thing that was sort of confusing is like, wait a minute, wait a minute, where's the original D3 repository? It's gone. This is this data is only about the um, you know after version four when D3 split up into modules. So I went back and I modified the scraping script to include the original D3 repository too. So now ah, cool. this, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Right. So that's why I think in a couple of the other examples you see this explosion around uh, I think 2014. But before that, there's not really any activity because in some in the original data set, the D3 repository was missing. But there it is. This gives sort of a, a more accurate picture. So I kept iterating on this. There was another cool intermediate stage, D3 broken night art. And this is sort of the final form with the axes and everything. And I iterated the, the layout and the colors and everything. And uh, yeah, this, this was a real pleasure to produce and also to read. Um, you can see that monolithic D3 development for years went on and on. And then in late 2014, all of these, you know, different modules got split out of D3. And the stack order here is the order in which they were introduced. So you can see over time, like first it was D3 format, and then there was D3 color and D3 scale and all this stuff. And then in modern times, we've got D3 Delaunay. It was a big push on that. And D3 Random. And then it sort of evens out. I want to also show that I um, was able to make the layers contributors as well. So now you can see um, commits by contributor per week with smoothing applied. And so you can really see, like in the early days, Jason Davies did a lot. And Christopher Monisset, who I had never heard of, actually has a lot of commits on D3. But of course, many, many thanks to Mike Bostock for, for doing the lion's share of the development work on D3. Amazing, amazing work. And in recent times, uh, Felipe Rivera is uh, quite a contributor. Who we heard from earlier. Yes. Now, the, the first plot you showed us, it was ordered by like history, like early to added later. Is there any sort of ordering happening with this one? No, th uh, this is, I think, using, actually, let me check. I think it's the wiggle, like the standard stream graph mm -hmm. sort of layout. Seems like yeah. they do kind of like the biggest in the middle and then kind of. Yeah, that's there. the magic of the um, stack offset wiggle. Which nice. Is a sort of great layout for stream graphs. And this has evolved into an open source project. Uh, where the scripts are more flexible. We used it to visualize Stamen open source. And I finally did a final iteration where I added more repositories like TopoJSON that are not mm. really part of D3. So this gives sort of a more complete picture. So thanks for That's letting awesome. me Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much, Karen. These are great. All right. Cool. I'll remove that. Keep on marching. Next, we have Ashish joining us. And Hello, everyone. I can share uh, my screen again, but if, if you want to take over, you're also welcome. I'm going to refresh. So it starts from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, this is looking very weird. It doesn't look like that on my machine. Oh, here, why don't you, uh, why don't you share your screen? Maybe there's something weird uh, going on in mine. Do yeah, you want to share? Kind of path, path bug that it is let, let, let me do that. Let me yeah, do yeah. That. Go ahead and share your screen and I'll put it on. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you're good. Okay, uh, can, you, can you see my screen? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, we just finished an 
like 15 ah, there we seconds go. and and then i just walk you through it cool So, uh, so first of all, thank you for uh, doing this, the D3 parade. And uh, when I first uh, saw, read about this, uh, I immediately, and, and, and I looked through the data sets available, uh, the blocks data set was there. And, uh, you know, I, I immediately knew that I, I had to do something with this because I, I don't know how the landscape would have been if not for blocks. And uh, when uh, it reminded me also of the D3 showreel, which I first came across uh, from Mike's talk on SVG Open back in 2011. And uh, you know, I, I just thought I had to do something uh, with blocks and you know, just, just remake that showreel, which I always wanted to do. Uh, so I, uh, I rebuilt this in uh, version six and uh, and, and 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 the data uh, is simply a number of blocks per year. It's grouped like that, and you know it just goes from one form to another. And uh, uh, the if if you guys have seen the initial talk, uh, it it ends with a loop. You know it starts from the beginning, and uh, I wanted to have an ending. Uh, so uh, this is the tribute uh, on the last screen. Uh, you, you see 2021 dot each represents a block and uh, these are sorted by number of folks and stars they have received on uh, gist uh, this this information was not in the data set so i uh, i scraped it and <laughs> i ran a script for 24 hours because you know otherwise they block you so <laughs> uh, so and uh, the connections that you see here is uh, 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 the, the authors. So, if you, if you click on any of the the link, uh, it will take you to the author page. And uh, if you click on any of the dots, it will take you to the block. And uh, these colors are the most used color. Uh, the first one that appears in the color information uh, for the particular block. And uh, the size is represented by you know the sum of folks and uh, stars that the block received. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is it about uh, this. Uh, uh, I especially want to, you know, thank D3, the community, Mike, of course, uh, because I'm, I'm a freelancer. Uh, I have I've been doing this since 2012 and 13, and I, I don't know where I would be if not for D3. So yeah, thank you. This is really cool. When I was first looking at it, I thought it was just the show reel, and then the re the reveal at the end of of this uh, uh, little graph of <laughs> sorry, I, I just go back. Yeah, the reveal at the end of just the blocks uh, floating around is a uh, is a really cool way, yeah, to to follow up uh, after the show reel is done. Thank you, Ashish. Let's see. And oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I was on mute. I thought I was talking it and happens. you couldn't hear me. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I feel like it's not a real thing unless that happens at least once. Like, I don't know. So um, what I was saying is <laughs> thank you, Ashish, for joining us. <laughs> and uh, and I was commenting on how, um, you know, it was, it was neat that you could actually click on these and it can, uh, you know, open up the project. So cool. I'm going to brush on past that. <laughs> and uh, Dan, here we go. Daniel. Okay, we'll Hi, Daniel. Up. Nope. Uh, here we go. I have this up, but you're also welcome to share your screen if you like.
Okay, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm hi. feeling having a little bit of net network problem. So if I try to share my screen, like my computer starts to heat up ridiculously. So I'm just going to talk through this. So I let me know I, if you want me to click on anything or whatever. <laughs> yeah, sure. So my my thought is I just want to have some fun with this hackathon, and in particular, I like to explore the block space. So on the top, you can see a histogram of the composition of blocks across the last ten years. So if you were to scroll the window around, you get a you see a random block, and if you click the shuffle button, it will shuffle the block within the timeline. So now the fun part begins is that I'm thinking, what can we do with the blocks? And since blocks are kind of reminiscent of rectangles, I'm thinking, let's create mosaics out of the blocks. So if you do click on that, it's going to analyze the image, segment it, and try to create a, a, a mosaic out of the neighboring blocks around the, around the uh, same similar time area. And if you were to hover over each of the little tiles, you can see the blocks. And if you click on it, it'll go back to the original uh, blocks website, like that. So you can just play around, create different arts. You can shuffle it again. You can create different mosaics. No, just, oh. just for people to have some fun. And that's, that's pretty much it. Awesome. It's fun to see it all like come together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so half of the half of the animation are written in D three, and half of them are in the uh, pure CSS three animations. Awesome. Cool. Well, I shared the link to this in the chat. So, if others want to play around and create mosaics, it's there for you. And anything else to add, Daniel? Uh, yeah, I'd like, just like to give a shout out to the community. Thanks for the last 10 years and looking forward to the next 10 years. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, Daniel. Any, any way to explore? Yeah. Make, make blocks out of other blocks. Mm hmm. Okay. Oh, those were, oh, here we go. And welcome. Hello. Hi there. Hello. How are you? I'm here. I'm fine. How are you? I'm I'm trying to share my screen. Oh sure, here. Uh, go ahead and click share, and I can add it to the screen. Uh, there we go. Perfect. Well, um, first of all, let me start with the most important thing. I want to say thank you for um, you, Molly and Kai, for um, hosting this amazing event. Uh, thank you, Mike Bostock, obviously, for um, creating something so uh, impacting so many people. And uh, last but not least, definitely thank you, uh, the whole community, um, which just uh, is so inspiring and so amazing. So um, I'm really thrilled and totally in love with the community and D3. So um, I did take a different approach, I think, than, than most others in, this, in the sense that I took my very first project, which I published on GitHub with D3 and um, try to um, uh, yeah, make it work for, for this very topic. So I used the block builder search data provided by um, Ian, uh, where he, uh, and, and there I counted um, the frequency of the D3 functions used in the blocks. So um, I basically, I basically um, got the 20, uh, D3 functions, which are used most often in the blocks from D3 select down all the way down to D3 mouse. And um, what I'm employing here is um, what I call item explorer, which I designed um, uh, initially for, for the idea, how do I explore combinatorial um, uh, combinatorial uh, solutions? So for example, if a customer buys a lot of products in a store, I might be interested what kind of products he bought in combination. And so uh, when you use pivot tables or pivot charts, I think you get kind of limited with interactions. If you use algorithmic approaches, um, you kind of struggle with the parameter settings if you do association rules. And, and that was basically the motivation for the chart. So initially it looks um, very plain. It's a regular bar chart. It is um, though somehow different. So what it says of this um, what you see at the top left, uh, 33,800 blocks, which contains at least any of these 20 functions. 
um, 32,414 uh, are employing D3 select, which is not so surprising, but you could see, for example, here later down, D3 select all is used much more rarely in 5,210 out of these most frequent ones. Um, at the bottom, you see the tick um, as abbreviation, whereas at the top with the tooltip, you see the, the full fledged function. As you notice immediately, I didn't, um, I didn't um, uh, reduce the data set to split among versions. So um, there will be functions which you cannot use or which you cannot you can syntactically, but you, you will run into errors if you use them together because they stem from different versions. So you have here D3 scale dot linear, whereas uh, you have uh, 6,979 blocks um, calling the D3 scale linear functions, which is I think starting D3 version four. And um, so what you see is basically independently for each function, how often in how many blocks they occurred. And what you could do, you could click on on um, on any selection. Let's say let's uh, click the um, axis. Let's say axis bottom, D3 axis bottom function, and then it updates the chart. And then you see how often the other functions are used conditioned based on the selections which have been already um, chosen. So basically of the blocks which contain D3 axis bottom, what kind of functions are called in addition? And then it, it's kind of interesting to compare. Well, what scaled is used more, most often with bottom uh, axis bottom? Is it scale ordinal or scale linear? And there you see scale linear is used 4,100 times, whereas scale ordinal is used much less often for the axis bottom. But we could explore further, you click, on the next one, then you have the number of blocks which contain both the axis bottom as well as the D3 scale ordinal. Let's make it a little bigger. And let's sort by frequency. And then we can see what are the next functions which are used in the same blocks as these ones. So obviously D3 select appears everywhere because it's almost used anywhere. Uh, D3 scale linear and so forth. And then you could, you could explore more um, so what you see is basically um, uh, the the conjunction of different of different filters. What you could use that too, as if I just uh, reload, um, is you could use a or connection instead of an and connection. So for example, you might be interested in asking yourself um, here, for example, D3 max. Um, look at the how many blocks have used either D3 max, D3 min, or D3 um, extend. So you would alt click on this, uh, then extend and D3 min. And then you see the number of blocks here at the top, um, 13,000, which used either of these functions. Let's make it again bigger. And then you could explore further. Then you see very often it's a D3 CSV is, is called to uh, pull in the data uh, with, uh, in, in combination with any of these functions. Or a third operation you have next to end and or, you have also the not operation. So let's just a third, a quick try. So as, as we see, not, surprising, uh, not surprisingly, D3 select is almost used all the time, but what about the blocks which didn't use D3 select? So we can shift click on this one. So it excludes the D3 select. And we look at all the blocks which don't contain D3 select. We see obviously D3 select all, is happening, but not in all of them. So there's qu quite over 1000 blocks which don't contain either D3 select or D3 select all. Um, yeah, that's basically um, it. So I, I, I used the data set. Well, thanks again, Ian, for providing that to get some insight. And I was super excited to see uh, like my very first GitHub project based on version three is still running. Um, in current browsers, so it's totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So yeah, you can see like what's used together and what's not used together, and this is very cool. I didn't. I, I think I didn't even realize quite how many, like how interactive it was when I first looked at yeah, it. So it was neat. To, it was neat to see you walk there, through it. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Kai. Right. Right. Oh. I, I thought. I thought initially I just. Um, submit a bar chart and if, if that gets accepted, then in 10 years, I'll submit a pie chart. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But Wait, so yeah, is this, the, is this, the underlying is, data is not just the bars, as you see, but it's really all the combinations of of these 20 functions being used together or not. And that's pulled up. And then it's interactively, you can explore basically the whole space. So is this awesome. still using version 3, the chart itself? Yes. Or, yes. This oh, is, OK. So this, yes. this is a visualization of version 4 and on using a version 3, D3 base. And there's that. Sorry? Wait, so this is a, a visualization of basically D3, later versions of D3, but the chart itself is D3 version 3. I think that's kind yes. of funny. Yes, the, the chart <laughs> is built with the D3 version 3. So I didn't upgrade the chart. But um, yes, I use all the functions which have been used up to now. So any function um, which have been pulled by, by, the, by the data set. Very cool. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah, D3 version 3 forever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! I think Mike would disagree with that. I should see him shaking his head in the I'll backstage. Just, Mike, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Mihail, for joining. Well, thank and, you and participating. Thanks, man. Thank you. Okay. We are next going to bring Julia and Owen. Hello. 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 Welcome. Thanks. Can we share our screen? Uh, yeah, go ahead and hit share, and then I'll replace it with yours. Right now, this is mine. Hey. <laughs> we have to open system preferences. Oh, no, not system Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I'll share mine for now. That's OK. We're, we, okay. we're good. We got it. Oh, you got it. OK. I hope so. In the meantime, I'm going to share this in the oh, chat. No, Hold on a second. Maybe just <laughs> if you touch that, we're gonna drop off because it's gonna make yeah. Colin quit. So well, that is so weird. Yeah. That we can't do that. But maybe it still let me. Let's try. There, does that work? Oh yeah. We okay, let me get off of that <laughs> screen real quick. There we go. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so hi, I'm Julia, and this is Owen. And thank you so much for having us as part of the parade. Uh, we're going to talk about our, our fun app that we made. But we have to back up just a little bit and talk about why we made it and then how it uh, ended up uh, with, in, in the D3 parade. So initially, we started um, making this app because we wanted to um, make uh, a better visual experience for browsing and joining channels in a Slack space. So of course, if you try to browse channels, this is the the database societies one. It's kind of hard to navigate and just see just how many channels there there are. Um, and so we wanted to make a visualizer, uh, which we did uh, as an app. And then when I saw the parade come up, I uh, I asked Molly if she would be up for us using um, it on Slack to visualize the D3 community channels for the Slack space. Uh, and of course, the app itself uses D3, and Owen will talk about that in a minute. But Ultimately, she said yes. So big shout out and thanks to Molly. So if I launch the visualizer, um, this is what you get. But before I show you this, I want to show you what it looked like before um, Molly went through and renamed things. So initially, when we first launched it, this is what the D3 channel landscape looked like. Um, everything was kind of compiled together around this uh, this main one. Um, and then, of course, we have these different nodes. And that is because the naming structure um, will pick and create a node if you have something like DataVis, for instance. Then you have Dash 2020 or Dash Tech. That will group them together. But you need to have more than one. And so going into... Uh, right, can I just break in here quick? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so basically, like, uh, I, I saw that and I'm like, oh, wow, like this might be hard for like for people to find what they're looking for. Like it'd be really helpful if we grouped locations together or languages together or whatever. So this is just like a really good case of where being able to see something visually, uh, you know, created this like, oh, maybe there's a better way to like organize this so people can find um, the channels they're looking for. So anyway, go on. And huge shout out to Molly for doing that, which is super awesome. And we really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, this is what the restructuring looks like. So if you click on something like location, of course, it will take you there. And since we're in Canada, maybe we'll click on Toronto. And if you're signed into your Slack already and you go visit channel, it's going to take you there. And so if you're not a part of that channel, it will, um, you know, you can join it if you want, um, or you can have a look at it. So that's kind of the app in a nutshell. I will. Um, go to Owen real quick just to talk about the D3 components of it. 
Uh, yeah, so the the app was pretty much screaming to be built in D3. Um, so it is actually... Do you want to go here and just talk about it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> this, this one here is one of the original prototypes. Uh, as you can see, it's a, a nice force graph here. And um, that was that was really fun to, to use the Slack channel data to visualize that kind of stuff. Um, but it was also like impossible to actually find channels uh, consistently. And then when we put it in with the actual data visualization Slack data, like as I messed around with the different settings, I mean, it it just there was there was a different method that we had to do. It was clear. So we tried circle packing, and we tried a, a lot of other hierarchical style. Uh, yeah, that's the circle packing data. Um, but we wanted it to be self-referencing. Um, so this is kind of the development of it. it started with circle packing. Then we moved it to hexagons. Um, and I used uh, uh, some modular, modular D3 libraries, such as uh, Hexbin and um, uh, Delaney, uh, to do the hexagons. Delaney was used to find the neighbors of the hexagons and then uh, do you I was talk able about to walk around. Great. Yeah, that's so. I made this for pollen, so I just put it on observable because it was like it's a pretty straightforward way to actually see hexagons. But that really helped me uh, develop the hexagon mesh. And then, uh, yeah, that, that's so. That's the data, data visualization societies before you add a design to it, um, and then uh, that's that's it right there. That's the data viz one, and of course, this is the the D three one. Yeah. So lots of. Lots of Zoom, lots of, uh, yeah, anyway, D3 with a bit of Webpack to uh, to be able to build it. but And it also works on mobile, which was a big <laughs> thing for us. And that... Of course. So lots of, <laughs> lots that, of resize. That, that took a minute. <laughs> yeah. It... But yeah, that's, that's, and I mean, so, so Pollen is a Slack app, and you can install it on any Slack workspace. Um, and so we, we had other people install it and, and give us feedback on it, too. And... Yeah, there, we're we're gonna make it like an official Slack app at some point, but we're still working on a few other things around it too. But it was so awesome to uh, be able to visualize uh, the D three um, Slack community. So we really appreciate uh, being a part of the parade and and letting us do that. Yeah, so awesome. Spurring Molly to action. Yeah. What did you say, Kai? Nice work spurring Molly to action on reorganizing <laughs> the uh, Slack <laughs> channel. <laughs> Yeah. Once I saw it, I couldn't not. Um, <laughs> and of course, there was other input involved. It wasn't just you know me running around. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I saw it and I was like, oh, uh, it just it was really clear. Yeah, that was kind of the big intent for it. It kind of almost works two ways. The one is that you can see everything and it's kind of easy to onboard people if you have this because you can be like, here's everything, have a look. But then at the same time, I've installed it on a couple of other networks I'm a part of on Slack and it was the same thing. It was like, ooh, okay, I better go in the channel naming and have a look here because that's not that's not a great way of organizing it. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Julia and Owen for joining us Thanks and so being a part of the parade. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, we are down to the last project. Um, so we'll bring Dario and Adamo to the stage. Hello. Hi, welcome. Hello, hello. Um, yours is pretty interactive. So I, I mean, I could share my screen, but if, if one of you want to actually walk through it, uh, I can yeah, share I, yours. Yeah, I can share. Uh, let, me, cool. let me get this working. Uh, yeah, he's got the good internet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hopefully that's okay. That has come up. Um, okay, great. So let me just switch that. Okay, cool. Yeah. So so for this uh, for for D three D three parade, we we essentially wanted to uh, showcase the community as much as as much as possible, and 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 to do that, we kind of um, you know early on uh, we were looking at tweets and we were looking at like all these cool visualizations in these tweets. And um, and I, I think Dario was telling me like like stop clicking on things. Like you have like a thousand tabs <laughs> open, and I yeah, just we wasted so much time on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, after that, I think we were like, okay, we have our idea uh, because this is fun. So we we, we really want to showcase uh, people's tweets. Be before you click on that, can I I, I want to add that? Uh, so this is the first time we use observable, um, and then. So we had to make this full screen because hashtag give us uh, more layouts or configurable layouts on, on observable. That would be that would be great. 
and and so this is that's that's kind of like why we need more uh, screen real space to show this. Yeah, and there was just a there was a bunch of t tweets. I think we had like I think there's around like sixty thousand tweets for the D three JS hashtag and. Uh, initially, we were trying to get like all the related tweets uh, from, from people, and that that turned out to be like millions, and uh, we were running out of uh, <laughs> space on observable. But uh, yeah, so so how how this sort of works is uh, we we sort of uh, plot down all the tweets. So uh, this is sort of like a graph, and every node is 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 a tweet, um, and you can kind of uh, click through the story and essentially. Uh, you can kind of go into each one of the tweets. So, you know, in, in the very beginning, th these are sort of like the initial tweets that like got picked up by our our, our scraper, um, which which essentially is not actually D three, but it's, it's someone uh, putting a link to D three um, in in their tweet. And then as you go on, you you have all these other like false starts. Um, I, I think uh, this, this one's actually like. Uh, Spanish. Oh, I went to it. Uh, but, but that was uh, that was Spanish uh, lead speak, which is which was kind of interesting. But as as you go on in the story, you you actually um, people start tweeting about the library and they start interacting with with each other. And you know, one thing that we really enjoyed was we got to learn a lot about the community um, through this. And you know, it was a community that we didn't know that that well. And now, you know, a lot of the people who showed up to this um, are, are people that we've, we've read, <laughs> we've read tons of tweets from. <laughs> yeah, I can see a bunch of the names uh, that we saw in the tweets uh, in the chat right now. Uh, so that that's actually super cool. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I think here, uh, this part of the story is like Ian Johnson's first D3JS webcast. And we thought it was cool because, like, as the story progresses um, and we see more more tweets, uh, we essentially see that uh, he's sort of working on a workshop um, later on. I think it's like the next year or or so on. But yeah, um, I guess uh, Dario, do you want to talk about some of the like hiccups we had on like actually trying to uh, make this in terms of like? We we like clustering and and stuff like that. Yeah. Um. So so once we have the uh once we had the 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 tweets uh we we kind of like came up with a quick and dirty hack to to cluster them and and add edges between them which we call the the zombie clustering, uh which was basically the idea that things that that are similar are like a zombie that belong to a town. And as soon as they get, they touch another tweet, they, the other tweet becomes a zombie now and belongs to the same town. And, and then, so these towns are like represented with the circles. I don't know, it's a bad analogy, but you know. <laughs> um, uh, and then, and then so uh, then after that, we, we, when we wanted to actually do the layout, um, so we, we went with uh, circle packing. Um, and the reason we went with circle packing and, and this is a, a shout out, I guess. Uh, it is the best circle parking algorithm out there. Like, <laughs> like there's no question about that. I ported that circle parking algorithm to like four languages already. Uh, so it's great. It's great. We, we, we really love it. We use it everywhere. So we decided to go with it as well here. Um, and then spirals. Maybe, maybe Adam, maybe you want to you wanna tell the spiral story. Yeah. So, um... For Spiros, we essentially we we found this this observable uh, notebook essentially that that detailed how to how to make these Spiros, and but but they came with this assumption that uh, essentially every circle is going to be the same size, and here you can see like that is that is just not the case. We have some massive circles and and, and some small ones, and so we we spent forever like <laughs> it was like nights and nights just trying to <laughs> to get that working um and we we came up with all these like at least four feet portions oh oh sorry i hear something in the background but i'm not sure um anyways yeah uh there there was yeah we were trying to get like the different spots to work together so that the circles weren't overlapping and it just took nights and nights to do it. And we came up with all these clever ways where we're like 
yeah, we're, we're, we're sort of calculating the, the, the radius of all these circles. And I think we just came across, like at the very end, we just decided we're gonna just like brute force it. And uh, we did, and it like it just suddenly worked perfectly. So that was that was sort of the the spiral story we we had here. Yeah, uh, shout out to Manfred. That is the it's the person that actually uh, brute forced the layout. Yeah, I I, I should say that um, this project, uh, how it began, was uh, we we essentially just pulled like tons of people from uh, the company that we work at. And we were like, do you want to work on this project after hours with us? Um, <laughs> and and a bunch of people just gracious, graciously uh, said yes, and they, they would uh, contribute. So um, th there's actually a, a bunch of collaborators. It's not just uh, Dario and I, but uh, tons of people just came and hung out with us uh, late at night and uh, sort of helped us out. Um, one of those people are here, uh, Dan Daniel Chang, actually. Uh, he he also uh, helped us out with uh, with some of this, and he has his his own uh, presentation as well. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah, this is very cool. I like this is like I thought a really good example of a visualization that like first walks you through a bit and tries to like tell a bit of a story, but then after that, it's kind of you can click on whatever you want and just like really explore. Yeah, we yeah. were, oh, go ahead, Tara. Uh, I was gonna say that uh, <laughs> a fun fact with, uh, with when recreating the story is we got so into looking at the stories and the tweets and how they connect and all that, that uh, we, it, it was kind of like the night before the submission deadline and we were still looking at tweets and, and like we could like, we, we were just like having fun looking at tweets rather than making the story and then like, we ended up having to, for a couple of years, be like, yeah, this year is, we're going to just say it's a community, <laughs> community dedicated year. Yeah, we, we have like this, this little editor that uh, we, sh we, we sort of hid, but uh, essentially it's a way of like making these stories. Um, and we like, I, I was just spending so much time just like having fun, uh, trying, <laughs> trying to just find like really interesting, uh, visualizations that yeah we we wasted like a few nights just just doing that i wouldn't, yeah, call, so I, I wouldn't call it waste <laughs> yeah, yeah. Part of the process, about, about right? yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so something else that i or i guess the final thing that i want to touch on is uh so one thing that this visualization showed that we actually didn't ex expect at all was um uh botnets and and like ad campaigns and things like that which are showing here so basically after we did the zombie algorithm as you can imagine like all the zombies uh, of the bots get together and then so all of these like hyper connected little networks uh of, of tweets are basically uh, uh like 90 percent of the time uh when you click on them you realize it's either a bot tweeting exactly the same thing or slightly different tweets or ad campaigns where it's a bunch of different accounts tweeting the same thing it, and and then so we kind of made a, a, a bot detection uh, visualization with this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this one here is like someone was trying to do th this was actually a hack that that no longer works, but it was like a PDF vulnerability hack. Um, and it was interesting because it, it coincided with the year that this this was prevalent. Um, and then like immediately after, like all, all of these bot bots like stopped. Uh, stop. Yes, as long as they patch the vulnerability, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a really cool project. Uh, you know, thanks for being a part of this and sharing it. Kai, any anything to to note or ask before we wrap up? Well, oh, there's, I mean, there's so many layers. You can see just like how much uh, uh, work all you all did and all your contributors <laughs> did to you can make see this happen. Nice. <laughs> the the tiered layout, uh, it looks great. Yeah. Thank awesome. You. Well, thank you so much, Dario and Adamo. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. OK, well, that actually that concludes all of the projects. Um, Very nice. So, Amazing. you know, claps to everybody. Uh, it was really fun to see all of those. And uh, for the last uh, 25 minutes, uh, we're going to bring Mike Bostock on. And if anyone has any specific questions for him, feel free to toss them in the chat and, and we can ask them. Um, 
and uh, yeah, we'll chat a bit about the D3 community. And so I'm gonna welcome on Mike. Hello. Hey, Mike. Hi, Mike. <laughs> good morning. Yeah, good morning to you. Um, yeah, we've seen a lot of, uh, uh, you know, these 10 years of D3 projects. Um, I don't know, do you have any like thoughts or observations on kind of this like growing community? Uh, well, it was pretty awesome to see like some of those old tweets and to sort of reflect on the last 10 years. I mean, it is, uh, you know, I feel like I'm always just staring at whatever's right in front of me and I'm worried about, you know, like <laughs> we had some database troubles this week uh, and trying to fix some bugs. And it's, it's fun to kind of take a moment and breathe and look back and remember kind of all those amazing things that happened over the last 10 years uh, and all the, the friendships and the people we got to meet along the way. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to kind of wrap it up in a nutshell. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. It's, yeah, it's pretty great. Though. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a walk down uh, memory lane, I'm sure, some of that. Yeah. Um, I was curious, something that came to my mind was, I was curious, uh, so there was Protoviz before this, which I don't know if you uh, saw Phil uh, share a project on, on that towards the beginning. Um, and then D3, I was curious about like what, uh, you know, what made you get started with D3 and yeah. what kind of inspired that? It was something uh, else that began with P also, which was polymaps. Hmm. Um, okay. So um, let's see, I was an intern at Stamen Design, which is like a visualization consultancy. Um, and I, as a, like a project there over the summer, we built this open source library called Polymaps. And Polymaps was basically like a, you know, tiled uh, map quad tree kind of pan and zoom library, um, but it supported, you know, GeoJSON overlays. And I think the interesting thing about it was that it really embraced SVG, because at the time, like all the mapping libraries were really using divs, you know, like you'd have a div with a background tile, and so it would just be a square image. and as you can imagine, you know, that had a lot of limitations in terms of what you could use in terms of graphics versus SVG. Um, and so Polymaps was like my first, I mean, obviously I had used SVG and some Canvas before that with Protoviz, um, but with Polymaps, I really tried to kind of uh, embrace the SVG-ness of it and like the, the possibilities. So like doing like weird things with clipping um, or other sort of effects um, and I really liked the fact that, you know, the, the richness is of SVG was exposed to you as part of the library. And of course, at the same time, like one of the, you know, I was getting all of these feature requests on Protoviz of like, you know, adding things like dashed strokes or um, clipping paths or, you know, drop shadows or gradients or whatever, you know, people wanted all of those things. And in order to add them to Protoviz, you know, you would have to like wrap the feature in SVG. Like, so everything that SVG could do, like it wasn't available by default. Like you had to add that, you have to expose it somehow in the Protoviz abstraction. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing at the time that I was struggling with was how to make uh, animation and transitions performant with Protoviz. So in the Protoviz model, you know, it's a bit like um, React where you're thinking about this like declarative representation of the scene. So you've got your data and you've got like some set of marks that are mapped from there and properties and that sort of thing. And so the challenge is like, you know, something has changed and you don't really know what. And so you kind of have to traverse the entire scene graph in order to update it. And that tends to make it really slow because you, you're either having very complicated diff algorithms or you're recreating everything from scratch and, and then the browser is kind of churning on all these DOM elements. So with D3, like I really wanted to do kind of two things, like, you know, it's sort of what led to the lower level nature of it. One is that I wanted to make sure that kind of all of the richness of these standards was exposed, um, you know, to users of the library so that everything would kind of be available by default. Anything that you could imagine doing in a browser like would be available. Any improvements that were added to you know, these web standards over time would be available and all that stuff. And then the second thing was like, you know, solving this problem where any change that you needed to make was performant. Like I was really wanted to minimize the overhead. You know, so if you had you know, thousands or tens of thousands of elements 
um, and you wanted to perform some incremental change to that, right? Like moving them around, giving them a new X and Y position, changing the color, that sort of thing. I didn't want to have to like, you know, traverse the entire scene graph, recreate everything from scratch, do the diff, that sort of thing. So the data join was this um, approach where you could really just tell it like, here's what's changed. And here's like the minimal set of operations you need to do to bring it up to date. And I think together, you know, that, that led to this kind of explosion and richness of what you could do. Yeah, totally. That's awesome. Uh, oh, go we ahead, Kai. I have a question from uh, Mihail in the chat. Oh. Um, when developing D3, how did you strike a balance, Mike, between what your plans are and uh, new feature requests coming in uh, from, from others from the outside world? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's a lot of different things. I think one thing is like, I tend to take it slow a little bit, like where you get that one request in and you're like, okay, well, I'll just let that sit for a while and see if another request comes in, you know? And I think what you look at, I mean, some of it is your own sense of your own intuition as to like what's going to be useful for people. It's also a question of like what the complexity is. There's like a cost benefit analysis where you're like, okay, this is, um, you know, if, if something is like going to be very rarely used, but has a high amount of complexity and is going to be a large maintenance burden, then it's like, okay, maybe we should do that as a plugin or an example or something else. Uh, whereas if something is like going to be, you know, very popular, really solves like some sort of core use case that people struggle with right now. And you've heard of people struggling with it, you know, or you've seen examples where, or, or work where people have run into this issue, you know, then I'm highly motivated to sort of take on that additional burden and incorporate it into the library. And then everything else is kind of somewhere in between. And you're trying to run this balance of like, you know, how much do we want to add versus how much do we sort of um, provide as either examples, tutorials, uh, plugins, you know, stuff that people do outside the library as well. And ideally, like, you should have both. Like, I think that has generally been true of D3. And I hope that that's like true of observable plot going forward, you know, where if something's not part of the core library, people can still find a way to, you know, uh, incorporate some plugin or, or other technique to, to still do what they want to do with the library. It's not that they're blocked from getting something done. It's just kind of a question of convenience. I have a question about plot. What, what's your vision for the future of, of kind of D3 and plot and Vega and Vega Lite and this kind of ecosystem of different yeah. um, tools? Um, well, plot is built on D3. So a lot of the sort of, you know, things that we're, the work that we're doing with plot is driving some of improvements that we want to make with, with D3. Um, some of like the core, you know, features. Like one small example is like we were working on, um, you know, kind of these bump charts and we wanted those to be easier in plot. And, you know, Phil had a suggestion of like having a bump curve. Well, I think actually there was an issue that's been open for, for probably a couple of years in the D3 shape repo of having a bump curve. Um, but we finally got around to doing that, you know, when it was clear that like this was the perfect sort of fix to, to enable bump charts uh, easily in plot. Um, and another, you know, a lot of the, so, so there's like core improvements to the abstractions, like shapes, um, scales, I think maybe another thing that I want to visit in the future, um, to try to clean that up uh, or make some improvements, make it more extensible, maybe do a couple things in a slightly different way. Um, but, you know, another, you know, big thing that's really changed over the last 10 years is the JavaScript language. Um, and in some ways like D3 was forward looking, like we adopted, ES modules, like as soon as they were available, um, you know, using rollup so that we could write everything as ES modules and then, you know, transpile it into something that the browsers at the time could support. Um, these days, like finally this year, Node is on board with ES modules. And so I think it's this kind of sea change moment where the JavaScript community can really start uh, having more consistency in terms of how libraries are packaged and distributed. Um, and so I want to, you know, update D3. So D there's going to be a D3 7.0, um, but don't panic. It's really just going to be about like the type equals module change. Um, so it'll be a change in terms of like how you consume it in a node environment, but the API, you know, is going to be backwards compatible. 
And someone asked about uh, how observable came into the picture. Sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's trying to make D3 more broadly available, usable, uh, just make it easier to do, to support what the community was already doing. Um, I mean, you saw some visualizations of blocks that people shared, you know, that was the like <laughs> tiny uh, side project Heroku app that I built one day uh, that serves stuff from GitHub gists. Um, and of course we also saw things like block builder uh, tributary, like some of the work that Ian and I think Kai worked on as well to, to make it easier uh, for people to work uh, on examples and to share those examples. Um, but you know, if you go back to that um, like D3 Express talk that I gave a few years ago now, one of the things I kept coming back to is sort of the, the, the challenges of writing interactive visualizations. And in particular, you know, using a low level library like D3 where, you know, it is performant um, and you can do anything that you want, but you are using kind of these um, low level abstractions. You know, you're using SVG, you're using CSS, HTML, all that stuff. Um, and also you're thinking about, you know, the, the state of your interactive application and how you need to respond to events and update that state and, and redo the rendering and that sort of thing. Um, and so like you can do anything you want, but it's still a lot of work. And I think over time, one of the things I have gravitated towards is really just more functional visualizations and less beautiful visualizations. Um, I mean, I still like things that are beautiful and I still like pushing the envelope and I still like, you know, um, beautiful stories and that sort of thing um, and developing new techniques. But I think I am, you know, ultimately, you know, I'm interested in visualization because it helps us understand something, right? Like it helps us see something in the data or see something in the world around us or understand, you know, the nature of dynamical systems or models or whatever else. Um, and that the goal, you know, is, is for us to have a better understanding and then to have ways of communicating that understanding to other people. And so I think, you know, the, if I can make that easier so that we can get to the understanding more quickly and get to the communicating of that understanding more quickly, um, then I want to support that. Um, and so it, it is a challenge of like how you make that easier without sort of restricting creativity, the expressiveness of what people can do. Um, that's, yeah, I think that's why it like takes such a long time. <laughs> like if it were easier, like we would have done it a long time ago. Um, <laughs> But I, I think that's what we're trying to figure out now, right? Is like, where can we make it easier without giving up that expressiveness and that creativity? Sure. Um, so, you know, that to me is kind of what the role of plot is. It's really to focus more on exploratory visualization, helping people get, you know, a meaningful visualization as quickly as possible, trying to develop more of kind of a, a fluent um, fluency, like in terms of like your ability to recall and write you know, construct a visualization without having to find the example that you need to copy paste from or to go back to the API reference and find the method. I mean, obviously you'll, you'll need to do some of that, but the goal is to minimize that as much as possible um, because it's all about speed. You know, everything that you, every step that you have, every additional step that you have to take in order to make that visualization, you know, that slows you down adds time between your question and the answer and the insight and your ability to iterate. Um, you know, I think plot and Vega light are in a very similar space. You know, they're both trying to support um, exploratory visualization. And I think, you know, if you like Vega light, you should absolutely keep using Vega light. Um, I think we're really, you know, I mean, overall, I'm agnostic about whatever you use, as long as you're, you know, I believe like I do in the value of visualization and then sharing insights. Um, I think, you know, the, the positioning of plot for us is, is really about um, JavaScript and, you know, trying to create the best environment for exploratory data analysis, um, you know, in a reactive notebook environment like Observable. Um, I think Vega Lite is, extraordinarily impressive from an architecture perspective in that they've been able to create this sort of purely declarative grammar that is um, in a sense language agnostic, like it can run in any sort of different environment. So you have things like Altair and Python, which generate a Vega or Vega Lite spec, and then that can be rendered sort of in the browser in JavaScript. Um, 
what I was hoping for observable plot is that it's really just, you know, JavaScript only or JavaScript first, you know, that's our target um, environment. And I think when you restrict it that way, it actually affords some greater flexibility in what you can do in JavaScript. So, you know, passing in um, functional definitions of channels or writing sort of custom marks or custom transforms that are all just JavaScript. And you don't have to sort of have a different um, language, like an embedded uh, domain specific language for doing those things like you do in Vega Lite, because it's, it needs to work in all these different uh, environments and runtimes. Um, and and hopefully, one of the things I'm also interested in, it, you know, coming back to that, what we were talking about earlier about sort of what's incorporated into D3 and core versus what's kind of uh, an extension or a plugin. You know, I'm interested in in the plugins that people build for plot and the extensibility there, um, and I'm hoping to see sort of um, the community uh, and, and all that activity around that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, for a long time, we've been talking about like, what's the the, the pattern for reuse uh, in D3, uh, you know, like the reusable charts essay and things like that. And I think one of the things I'm excited about plot is that because it is this higher level abstraction, there's much more of a scaffold there, a place for people to create their own higher level of abstractions and then reuse those uh, more successfully um, you know, doing more than than is possible to do with D three because it's so low level. Oh, totally. Yeah, I I've had fun uh, learning and playing around with plot and just being able to make something with a line and make a bunch of different plots like so quickly. Yeah, um, it's funny. Like you you make stuff that you wouldn't make in D three because mm -hmm. like it, why not? You could just hit shift enter <laughs> and then it appears. And it's, it is one of those surprising things where it's like you feel like you're fast enough with D three. I mean, maybe you don't, but so I often feel like I'm fast enough with with whatever D3 stuff I want to make. Um, but then you use something like plot and you're like, wow, there there is like, you know, all of these things that I could be looking at that I just wouldn't have looked at before because it would be too tedious to do. And now I can. And that's uh, that's fun. Yeah, to it seems like even if uh, like the end point you're planning on using D3 uh, plot is still like uh, it's a it's a good place to start. Uh, you can try things out. Um, yeah, I know. In like the talk you gave in February, you talked about how like sometimes it's hard to know what exactly you want to do. Like until you actually put the data into a visualization, it's hard to know what's going to work. You can get set on wanting to do things in a particular way because you saw an example. And I feel like with plot and Vega Light and other things like this, like you get to try that out much more quickly and then maybe you're less likely to get caught on something. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, the design process is this iterative process and you're, you, you want to do sort of your more uh, wild exploration at the beginning um, so that you, you know, you don't get trapped in that kind of local minima or minimum um, and so you, you kind of do this like broad search and you're like, that looks interesting. And then once you can kind of commit to that, then you can start doing sort of more in investing in that approach. Um, whether that's like, you know, making your plot more customized or switching to, you know, something lower level like D3. Totally. Uh, Actually, there's a related question on uh, on the New York Times. I don't know if you call it Jared's question on. Yeah. Um, New York Times influence, perhaps uh, how, how projects go with the New York Times. Wait, related. is that not the? Oh wait, you're talking about a different one. This one. Yes. This one, yeah. Did your time um, at the New York Times influence yeah, any um, directions you took at D three? I'm trying. To, I'm blanking on like a specific example right now. Um, I'm reasonably sure that any number of visualizations that we worked on translated directly into you know the features that we added. Of uh, two D three, um, but I don't remember any specific ones off the top of my head. You know, I know like I don't know. There was a visualization we did once that involved uh, the NCAA schools and like how the various schools like moved within the different whatever they're called, like the subdivisions of of the NCAA, like the the Big Ten and the. I'm not, I'm not that big into sports ball, as you can tell. Um, 
but we had to do all of this like you know math this like uh i don't i don't think it was like simulated annealing but it was some sort of like um greedy optimization where we you know we wanted to minimize the number of crossover in these paths and that ended up being kind of a similar technique that the sankey diagram uh was using um yeah so i think a lot of them there's probably a line that you could draw between between a lot of the NYT visualizations and some of the improvements that we made to, to D3. But I'm Very sorry, cool. I'm not remembering a specific one. <laughs> it was a while ago. Yeah, I know. Uh, we have a question from Maya. As you reflect back, are there any off-label applications of functions, uh, anything specific you intended or thought would be used one way but saw people apply in another way? I mean, all the time, but again, like, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good example here. Um, I mean, there's lots of different ways that like people, you know, misuse D3. I think like the most common one that I see is like the select all pattern being like mm -hmm. slightly wrong, like typically like forgetting to select the root of your select all, right? So we talk about like the select all data enter append pattern, but it's actually select, select all data, enter, append. You know, that's like five steps there. And if you forget the first one, um, then you're doing like d3.select all data, enter, append. And what that means is you're actually going to append those elements to the root element of the document because there isn't another root element. And so normally you're doing svg.select all, you know, or d3.select svg.select all. Um, and so you're kind of providing this context. So, I mean, that is an example where the join pattern, the selection.join that we added, um, oh God, I don't remember what version that was, but like five dot something, I think, um, or maybe it's six dot something. Anyway. Yeah, maybe, I don't remember. <laughs> that I think, like, you know, helped address a lot of the, reducing the number of steps that are required for sort of the basic data join pattern. And I think that's really important when people are getting started and they don't, you know, they, they want to make a visualization. They don't want to spend, you know, all day long, like just learning the intricacies of the data join pattern. I mean, they may want to get to that eventually, like after they understand sort of, and they want to do like transitions or animation or other sort of more advanced techniques. Um, but it was kind of front loading a lot of complexity in order to do something relatively simple, uh, you know, just to create three circles. Um, sure. And so I think the join pattern helped simplify that, um, at least in this common case. Um, so I wish I had thought of that sooner and done that sooner. I think that would have saved a lot of headaches. Um, you got there in the end. Yeah. Um, I don't know, what else? I mean, there's, the question is interesting because and often like presupposes like a certain type of use. Whereas in some ways I think like D3 is low level enough that it doesn't presuppose a particular type of use. You know, like there's no wrong way to call a function. Um, I mean, you, you just call, <laughs> you call it. I mean, there's, and so like, you know, you can kind of you assemble those low level pieces of scales, you know, or, or shapes or whatever, kind of however you want. Um, and for sure, like, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, cases where I've seen that I think people focus too much on kind of the bells and whistles over the, the insight, you know, trying to show something like show a pattern in their data, um, try to communicate something. Um, one of the uh, gut checks, you know, that we would use at the New York Times that I really liked was, you know, whether you could write an annotation about your visualization, right? Like whether you could actually say something in plain English, you know, or whatever language you spoke about the visualization that you made. Because if you can't say something about it, like just in plain spoken words, you know, then maybe you haven't actually learned anything about your data. And therefore, like, you know, are, what are you really trying to do with the visualization that you're sharing? Um, sure. Is it just a, a pretty picture? You know, is it just art? Like, and that's fine if you want to say that it's just art, but I think like you should be honest with yourself about what you're trying to 
um, achieve with your visualization, sure. like whether yeah, you're well, trying to share some insight or whether you're just trying to make something that's pretty or whether you're trying to like learn some new technique or demonstrate some technique. I mean, I also feel bad because, you know, a lot of the D3 examples by their nature, they're demonstrating techniques. They're not necessarily good visualizations. Um, and their purpose is not to communicate some insight about the data. Their purpose is to demonstrate some technique that you can incorporate into your own work. But it also kind of blurs that line a little bit where, um, you know, the, if they are seen as examples of good visualizations, even though they're devoid of any sort of uh, information that they're trying to communicate, that uh, kind of blurs, I don't know, maybe it sets the wrong expectations. Sure can lead to uh, too much focus on uh, look at this cool way that this yeah, on the, on the moves techniques, yeah. or whatever uh, and less about the story. Yeah. So. I mean, where it's easier to do that with or to, to have more meaningful visualizations with plot. And I'm not saying that we're doing a perfect job there, um, but because you know, that it is a higher level of abstraction, I think it's easier to sort of, try to create something that is more representative of like a visualization that people would actually make if they were trying to understand something in their data and not just like a, a specific technique um, that's kind of devoid from the overall process of exploratory data analysis. Sure. Well, uh, I know we're up on time, but um, maybe we'll just wrap up with the last two questions. Does that sound good? Sure. Uh, so this, uh, a quick one. Someone wants to know: Is there an example of how to write or uh, how to extend or write a plugin for Plot? Yeah, there's a bunch that um, Phil has shared. There's a tooltip plugin, for example. Um, we're going to um, release more documentation um, and examples of that in the coming weeks. Um, I think you know we we want to give you some. There's some interaction plugins that we're working on, for example. Um, so that's coming soon. I think in the meantime, you know, you could just dive into the plot source code and try to look at how those marks are implemented or how the transforms are implemented. Um, and, cause it'll be similar to that. Cool. And then, uh, these last questions are related. So I'll kind of, uh, read them both out. And I think it's a good way to close. So, uh, Bob asked, are there any major data viz areas where you th see D3 expanding into or changing majorly? or has it reached its boundaries of the data viz world? And also uh, Radham has asked, uh, if you have to predict the future of web technologies, where do you think they will go? And these <laughs> seemed wrapped up together, so. Yeah, uh, I don't think I'm gonna attach that last one. I think okay. that's like, that's, that's right. I'll go back to this one then. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like being Nostradamus or whatever. <laughs> um, well, it's weird because like you would think, I don't know, it's. I'm going to reflect on it briefly. You know, it's there's so much complexity still to everything that we're doing. And you in some ways you like you would want that complexity to go down over time like so that people could you know actually understand the systems that they're building, but I think my biggest fear is that like we just kind of layer complexity on top of complexity and then we're more and more like detached from the things that we're building and so people don't understand it and Anyway, like it's a difficult problem. Like I just, I want things to be simpler and for people to understand them. But I do find that there's like, it's human nature to try to abstract things and package them up and try to like sweep that complexity under the rug. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I don't know if that really answers your question. <laughs> it's more of a philosophical observation on the <laughs> uh, ballooning nature of technology. Um, so for data viz areas, um, I mean, I think it depends on like what, you know, I, I, it's not like my goal for D3 to be used everywhere in a sense, right? Like my goal is, um, to help people better understand the world around them or patterns in their data, you know, or to, to employ visualization as a technique, um, as a skill for finding insights and for communicating them. Um, and the tools that I build are in service of that, like trying to find better ways to uh, unlock those skills for everyone. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I, I introduce new tools over time because I think that there are either new, better approaches or complementary approaches for sort of different areas. 
you know, like when, when D3 first came out, there was a lot of grumbling about why we were making D3 rather than just sort of doubling down on Protoviz or continuing to improve Protoviz. Um, and so some of the reasons that I gave already, you know, about the, the, the benefits that you get when you take this web standards approach and by being able to build on all of these existing technologies, um, you know, using your browser's debugger and using all the richness that's already available to you inside of the browser, in my view, like outweighed, you know, this, the abstraction that Protoviz provided, which which did have some of its own benefits, it was more tailored toward information visualization. But that the net benefit, um, to, in my view, was that you know D three was better, and I think we saw that in terms of the the use cases that it unlocked. Um, but I think now you know I'm interested in this more exploratory visualization again. And coming back to sort of how do we help people sort of very quickly come to some understanding, find some something interesting in their data or in, in whatever it is that they're trying to understand, um, and how do we help them sort of communicate that insight to other people? Um, and I think the other thing that, of course, is center of mind for me these days with Observable is like the the collaboration, right? The the workflows of like how people work together around data and not just individuals, um, you know, where you have people that are, they're doing something interesting with data, but they're not like doing it, you know, uh, out in space. <laughs> like they're, they're doing it as part of a team. They have other people that care about this stuff that they're working with, that they're trying to like, you know, explain things to them or affect decisions um, or, or teach or whatever it is. Um, and, and also like the this community of like where people are developing new techniques and then you know they have the capacity to package those up and make them more available to everybody else and how can we facilitate that like how can we m improve the tools so that they're more amenable to reuse and to sharing um you know is something that i'm interested in so to me it's all about um you know believing that this like that the visualization and the data can help us make better decisions and to sort of generally be smarter in some sense. Um, and then, you know, what tools do we need in order to make that more available to everybody else? Um, and I think I am always looking for, you know, how we can do that without really sacrificing the, the majority of the value, you know, like I, I like compositional approaches where people can really, <clears throat> be creative and do new things. Like I, I hate the idea of a tool that just enumerates like here are the 10 solutions to this problem and you pick one. Like I <laughs> never want to build a tool that does that. I want to be like, you know, here's a screwdriver and here's a hammer and here's a saw and here's the ruler, you know, and it's like, then you just build whatever you want with that. And I get to like watch you build this amazing thing with it. And that's what excites me. Um, but I think, you know, we're always, striving for these tools that are still powerful while being accessible um, to a wider audience. And I think that work will never be done. Totally. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for, you know, answering everyone's questions. Uh, before we close off, is there anything that you want to add? Any last thoughts? No, I just want to say thanks to everyone. Uh, it was amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, Mike. All right. Well, that closes up everything. Uh, Kai, well, any last Molly. words? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I get the last words. It is, I mean, it's just been an incredible <laughs> over 10 years. Yeah. It's, and I mean, thanks, Mike, for growing and sustaining this community. Um, yeah, totally. I think, yeah, we're, we're all happy to be here. And it's just incredible how much D3 has grown. Yeah. And this was really fun. It was so fun to see everyone's projects and uh, you know, hear from Mike on some of those questions. So thanks everyone for joining us and yeah, thanks everyone. Have a good one. Bye.